What's up? Good morning, Three Creeks. My name is Joel. I get to be the pastor here. If you are uh, used to coming here on a Sunday morning, then you probably walked in this morning and thought, it smells a little better than it typically does in this room. And that's because 35 of the men in our church are off at a men's retreat. This is a picture of them uh, right there. There they are. They are uh, stinky, and they've been camping for two days, and they're not here this morning. And I celebrate that Aaron and Jim and Josh and Joe, uh, just four guys in our church who felt led by the Lord to start this thing, uh, have a bunch of men on a men's retreat this weekend. This is a picture of Nick, good, just wonderful man of God, making it smell good out there too. And uh, this is a picture of them just diving into God's word and what it looks like, what it feels like, what it should look like to be a man, a man of God. So fired up to have uh, men in our church leading out in this way. We miss them, but they will be back. If I could go back to high school and retake one class, for me, it would definitely be, I would love to go back and take some history classes. I feel like this happens to men in their 30s. We just all of a sudden begin to care about history more than we used to. I have to be honest and say it feels like for 35 years of my life, I just kind of wasn't paying attention to anything. Like I I remember going to Washington, D.C. as a middle schooler and just, but I don't really remember going to Washington, D.C. as a middle schooler. I remember I was there. I've seen the pictures, but I, where was I? I don't know. Now I would kill to get to go back and take my family to D.C. and, and dive into whether it's American history or, or world history. Uh, I just am eating it up. So I'm reading books about it. I am even more better for me is I'm watching documentaries about world history. And part of world history that maybe fascinates me or interests me the most um, feels funny to say it, but man, world wars and the Vietnam War and the Revolutionary War, which I recently found out we were a part of. I'm telling you, I wasn't paying attention. And man, I I recently stumbled upon this documentary on the Vietnam War, which lasted like 20 years. And it ended before I was born. I did a project about the Vietnam War when I was in eighth grade, I remember. So I remember there was one. And man, just to go back and to, to learn about what preceded it, what made it build, and why we got involved, all the things has been fascinating. But for me, maybe what has been the most fascinating part of it, maybe you're already there. Maybe you're like, Joel, welcome to earth. Of course, we all know this. But for me, what, was, what has been so fascinating has been just some of what the soldiers had to go through and how unbelievably challenging and difficult it is to be a soldier. And then also what is, what is really amazing to me is how collectively, how laser focused they are as a group. I mean, they have one objective and they don't really get sidetracked. They are a team. And then one of the reasons why it works, a good army, a good soldier, is because they are so quick to obey whoever is in charge. Whoever is over them, whoever is giving the orders, there really is no contesting or questioning. It's, it's yes, sir. It's yes, ma'am. And then as a, as a group, they're able to be successful because they quickly obey. If you think about the Bible, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you've read the New Testament especially, you'll you'll read about lots of different illustrations or examples that are used to describe Christians. So, you know, you'll read a passage of scripture that says we're like sons and daughters and we have a father. And then you'll read another story that says we're like sheep and we need a shepherd. And then you'll find out we're like trees and we're supposed to bear fruit. And then you'll find out we're like clay and and God is the potter and he's He's molding us and shaping us. And then you'll find out that we're like a runner competing in a race. Lots of illustrations. In the book of 2 Timothy, Paul uses a couple of these. But one that he drills down in on, in the first few verses of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, is he calls us soldiers. He calls the person who follows Jesus a soldier. He implores us to be 
what he describes as a good soldier. Not just a soldier, but a good one. And Paul knows a little bit about soldiers because I don't know how long ago it was, but Paul is in jail because Roman soldiers have put him there. So I don't know exactly how he feels about soldiers and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to act, but he says to Timothy, his young protege, a man who's probably 15 or 20 years younger than him, endure hardship like a soldier. Be a soldier, Timothy. So I just want to dive in to verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2 in 2 Timothy today. And just in case you haven't been here so far, you need to be reminded that Paul spent 30 years planting churches, telling people about Jesus all over the known world. And at the end of these 30 years, when he's about 60, maybe 65 years old, he's thrown into prison. And it is from this prison where he is, he is awaiting the day of his execution. He writes a letter to his protege, his teammate, his friend, someone that he calls a dear son, Timothy. Not a biological son, but a spiritual one. And he writes in this letter to encourage him to be a good soldier in Christ Jesus. So check this out. This is what verses 3 and 4 say. This is where we're going to be today. We're not going to rush through it because we've got enough time to, to chew on every little phrase. He says, join with me, Timothy, in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So the first sentence, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You definitely do not need me to tell you this, but being a soldier is very difficult. I wouldn't know. I've never been a soldier, but by all accounts, it's not easy. It involves suffering. From day one of boot camp, it involves suffering, hardship, probably like I've never endured before. 15% of people who start boot camp in the United States Armed Forces don't make it until graduation. And some of that's because of injuries, but most of it's because they, the people that have signed up underestimate how challenging that it will be. A few weeks ago, Uh, in this series, I confessed to you that I'm concerned that I've been a part of something in the American church that has done a great disservice to the advancement of the good news of Jesus in our country. And what it is, and I I confessed that I I am not innocent here, that, that pastors have reduced sharing the gospel or just trying to get the good news of Jesus out there. We've reduced it to like a religious timeshare presentation. Do some of you remember this? About how we just, will do anything to get you in here. We'll put you in a comfortable seat. We'll give you a cup of coffee. We'll have slides. And at the end of the presentation, we'll ask anybody if they want to sign up. But pretty much, we just highlight the good parts, the friendships that you can have, the joy you can have. We just highlight that, but we really don't spend a lot of time emphasizing the cost, the sacrifice, the hardship, the suffering that probably is coming your way according to every book in the New Testament, according to Jesus himself. And so I've I've confessed, I apologize for almost trying to pull one over on you. It's not how I want to teach. I want to pick, I want to paint the whole picture. It's probably more like, to to invite someone to follow Jesus, it's probably more accurately like a Navy SEAL recruiter talking to someone who's thinking about becoming a Navy SEAL. And that conversation is different. It's, It's not, he's not trying to seduce him into it or her into it. He's saying, I'm not sure if you're going to have what this takes. This is going to be the most difficult thing you've ever done. This is going to be, I mean, you're going you're gonna to have no regrets. It's going to be awesome. At the end of it, you're going to say, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, the greatest thing that I ever did, but, but this is not going to be a walk in the park. Paul can say these things to Timothy. Paul can say, endure suffering, because if you consider what Paul has been through, he has a lot of ground to stand on. 
In fact, back in the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter that he wrote a few years prior, so, so this doesn't even include some of the latest suffering that Paul's had to endure. To the Corinthians, he writes, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was pelted with stones. Three times shipwrecked. Spent a night and day in the open sea. A night and the day in the open sea. I've been on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from fellow Jews, from Gentiles. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. And on top of this, I've had the, 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 just to carry the, the, the weight of leading churches. So Paul's going, hey, Timothy, listen, man. I've lived 20 years more than you. And I just got to warn you, it isn't going to get easier from this point forward. If you're going to step up and follow Jesus, you're inviting persecution into your life. Don't be surprised if it comes. It's coming. And what Paul wants Timothy to know right here, when he says endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, what he's saying is that to achieve victory, which, which in, in other words, to get what we want and to get what God wants, it will not come without significant cost and without significant sacrifice. And I've got to tell you that I am, I am saddened. I am grieved I'm not throwing rocks at you. I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself with you in this. I am grieved at how comfortable we have become with hearing about Jesus' sacrifice for us and how uncomfortable we are with the idea of being sacrificial for him. There is a wide gap For most of my life, yeah, definitely most of my life, here in the United States, it has been to my social advantage to be a Christian. And, and certainly for those of, the, those of us in the room that are older than I am, you might reflect on living in the 60s or the 70s and the 80s, and it was for the most part, socially advantaged. There were perks to being a Christian. It was, it was respected. In fact, pastors in the 70s, like 70% of the country thought that they were a trusted individual, now 36%. So, so the collective respect or trust for anybody who is a pastor or even a Christian is just, is really, and it's becoming more and more costly to be a Christian in our country. I, I can't imagine that it's really going to turn in my lifetime. And so when I think about my kids growing up, I think, yeah, they're going to have to pick a side. Because the one foot in, one foot out, that's not going to work. That's not going to work because there's, there's, there's an increased cost to saying that you follow Jesus. And so really... On one hand, you might think, oh boy, this is going to be tough for the church if it's going to start to cost more. But good news is that historically, if you look at the last 2,000 years, the church always grows the most when being a Christian costs the most. It is galvanizing. And, and I think maybe, if I'm just being honest, there's a lot of lukewarm stuff going on in our church, in many churches, and there's really nothing to join. There, there's not, why would somebody come and just kind of be half in, half out? To get what we want and what God wants will not come without significant cost, without significant sacrifice. And then he says, no one's serving as a soldier. This is very interesting. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in what Paul says are civilian affairs. What's he talking about? Civilian affairs. Okay, so I've been watching these documentaries, loving them. I described one of the things that impresses me the most, that is the most noteworthy to me, is the fact that they are, they are so single-minded. 
they have one objective as a unit. It is get that guy or storm that beach or climb that hill or rescue that person. There is one objective and, and soldiers are not doing anything else while they're on mission other than trying to accomplish their one objective. This is what I gather from watching a documentary on these soldiers. And so I just want to turn it on us, turn it on you, and just ask you a couple questions in a row. If a group of people watched a documentary of your life, like the Truman Show, watched a documentary of your life, what would they deem as the main objective of your life? Think about that just for a second. If somebody got to watch you 24-7, What would they deem as the main objective in your life? What if there was no volume? They didn't get to hear you say anything, but they got access to your credit card statements and they got access to your calendar. What would they deem as the main objective of your life? For those of you that have families and you have children, if we asked your kids, What does your mom love the most? What does your dad love the most? What is the main objective of their life? What would they say? Because they kind of are watching a documentary. They're up close, soaking it all in. I'll bet you they'd have a pretty good answer. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. In other words, they're not scattered. They're not all over the place. They're single-minded. They're focused. They have an objective. And they're not getting entangled with other things. In other words, this is the way that I think about it. For a good soldier, things that don't really matter don't really matter. You hear me on that? Things that don't really matter don't really matter to a good soldier. And this doesn't mean that we all have to sell all of our stuff and move into the mountains and live as monks. But it does mean that things that don't really matter don't really matter to me. I was thinking about this and I I came up with an incredibly profound illustration. Uh, This will, if if kids were in here, there's no way they would get this. Um, Only you seasoned adults will be able to understand this silly string illustration that I need to do here. Um, Claire. Would you come up here? Claire was down here copiously taking notes. I'm interrupting. I'm sorry. Okay, so here's what I need you to do, Claire. I need you to stand right there and uh, just try to shoot me as best you can there. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, it got me a little bit. You can go ahead and... Just put that down there. Sorry, Chase. <laughs> Claire, great job, by the way. That, I was kind of hoping it wouldn't hit me, but. And, and this one is, let's see what this says. Ooh, okay, partying, partying. That was what was trying to, quote unquote, entangle me. And for the most part, other than a little bit of college, I dodged it. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so I am a good soldier who has successfully avoided getting entangled in a civilian affair, something that doesn't matter. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, ooh, but that's actually not what it feels like. This is actually what it feels like. Go ahead, the rest of you guys. This is what it feels like to try to avoid getting entangled in civilian affairs. Oh, jeez. Okay, that would be enough. Thank you, Ben. Here, can you guys put these right here? I need to read the labels on these things. I'm about to step on some toes here. So if you're the sensitive type, my apology. No, I'm not apologizing. So this is actually what it feels like, at least to me, 
Because there's a lot being thrown at me, trying to entangle me, trying to get me off of my main objective. And so I, I have to pick up these potentially entangling civilian affairs, and I start reading the labels. Ooh, professional career success. Golf. Physical fitness. These aren't bad. They're not bad at all. My political party affiliation. Ooh, I like this one. Fantasy football. Let's see this one here. The Buckeyes. Or owning a pet. Or taking vacations. Or being wealthy. See... I need you to hear me on this. None of these things are bad. They're not sinful. They're not wrong. And they're meant to be fun. Look, it's silly string. They're meant to be fun, but they are not designed to be. They are not meant to be the most important thing in our lives. They're not even supposed to be close to the most important thing in our lives. They're meant to be enjoyed, but unfortunately, we have taken... And I'm including myself. We have taken things that are meant to be enjoyed and we have let them entangle us to the point where maybe you had a hard time answering that question. What's the most, if people watch a documentary of your life, what would they say is the most important thing? What would they say is the main objective of your life? I've got to, I'll just, from my perspective, if somebody spends time with me, somebody knows me even a little bit, And my name comes up in a conversation. Oh, Joel. And if the first thing out of anyone's mouth is, oh, yeah, the guy that golfs. Oh, yeah, the guy that likes to hunt. Oh, yeah, even, even, oh, yeah, the guy that's the pastor, excuse me, the pastor of that church. If those are quick off the tongue, when someone's asked about me and and kind of what they would describe me as or identify me as, if those are the first things, man, I, I am missing the mark because my, my objective is not to be a golfer or a hunter or even a pastor. My objective is that if anybody would spend any time with me, even just a little bit, that if my name was brought up in conversation, that the, the first thing off the tongue would have to, would have to be, man, that guy, he follows Jesus. He loves God the most. To him, it doesn't seem like anything else matters. He's so focused. That's what I want to be said about me. And I know for sure I'm not batting a thousand. And I I just want to go on record to say I am not anti-Buckeyes. I am not anti-vacations. I'm not anti-you being successful in your job but I am anti you considering that the most important thing in your life. So so many of these things that we enjoy so quickly entangle and they begin to matter way too much to us. And what Paul's saying is that, hey, for a good soldier, things that don't really matter don't really matter. They're enjoyed, but they're not entangling and they don't get people off of their main objective. That's the wire. They don't get people off of their main objective. And for me, that would be being a man of God and following Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. But rather, do I have any more on me? Is it distracting? We good? Here we go. Okay. But rather, instead of becoming entangled, rather tries to please his commanding officer. Good soldiers, they obey quickly. They don't contest their commanding officer. They trust their commanding officer. They know that it is for their good to listen to their commanding officer, for the good of those around them, for their team. It is good 
to trust the commanding officer. In the mind of a good soldier, it is not sign up and do what I want. It is sign up and do what I'm told. Sign up and do what he says. Sign up and do what she says. We, we uh, as a church family, went through the book of James this summer. And we talked about this a lot, at least while I was here in June. This, uh, this, this idea that, man, there is such a temptation to read this or sing about this or talk about this, memorize this, learn what this says in the Greek. There's a great temptation to, to, to have a real good grasp on what this says. But when it comes to actually doing it, man, that's a whole different ballgame. And we talked about, we, we, we highlighted in the book of First John that John writes that what is love? Like how do, you, how do we demonstrate our love for God? It's easy. Just obey his commandments. Do it. Just do it. And there's a great temptation in my life, and I, I'm, I'm sure that you can relate, to know what this says and to drag our feet on doing what it says. Because we can interpret our way out of it, or let's just be honest, it's a lot easier sometimes not to do what it says. And that, that hesitancy, it's not, it's not really a knock on our character as much as it is a, a trait, perhaps, of our faith. That our faith, I think we drag our feet because we're not convinced that God has our best interests in mind. We think we have our best interests in mind. But a solid, true faith in the God that sent his son to die for us would, man, just that sentence right there would be evidence that he has our best interests in mind. So in response to this passage today, let me ask you a few questions as we close. I I try, rather rather than giving you your action step, if you've been around Three Creeks, you've probably noticed that I like to end my messages with a series of questions that really give the Holy Spirit the space in your life to answer them. Because I don't know what God wants you to do. But let me ask you a few questions that might help give some space for God to speak into your life. In response to these verses today, what do you sense God prompting you to do? If a group of people watched a documentary of your life, what would they deem as the main objective of your life? Is it possible that you have become entangled in something that was meant to be enjoyed? Is it possible that you have become entangled in something that was just meant to be enjoyed? What do you sense God prompting you to do? Does something that doesn't really matter really matter to you? And if you do sense God prompting you to respond to these two verses in a certain way, do you trust God enough to do it? Do you trust him enough to do it like a good soldier quickly obeys his commanding officer? Quickly, without hesitation. He has my best interest in mind. He's he's wanting to lead me to life, not death. Do you trust he has your best interests in mind? It's not easy, it's very hard, but that's what a good soldier does. That's what it takes. It's what it takes. God is not a, he's not a cosmic killjoy trying to rip you off and give you a, a, a lame version of life. Jesus said, I've come to, have, to give life and give life to the full. He really does have our best interests in mind, but he can't, he can't give it to us in full without obedience on our part to trust him. So, so with that said, I think there's 
man, I hope, I've been praying that there would be some, some real chewing on some of this. And I think a great response for us as a church family in this moment would be to take communion, would be to go back to Jesus and what he's done for us and just to spend time with him, reflecting on his goodness for us. When we take communion here at Three Creeks, we like to, uh, I like to remind you to try to do three things as you take communion. So there's a table there, table there, table there, table there. And in a second, I'm going to say, hey, let's go take communion. You're going to go up there. You're going to take the cracker. You're going to dip it in the juice. You're going to go back to your seat. But before you put it in your mouth and chew it up and kind of move on, and it's, it's such a good practice to slow down in that moment and to do this. First, you take 30 seconds and you look back. You reflect on your life and you reflect on Christ, on what he has done for you, on the fact that he died on the cross for us. And so we look back for 30 seconds, we reflect rear view mirror and then after we've thought through what Christ has done for us and reflect a little bit on our own life we actually open our eyes and for 30 seconds we just look around we look around we, we see people in here probably that we know and definitely that we don't know but in that you're reminded that you are not the only person that needs to take communion you are not the only person that needs your sins forgiven we are all in this together. It is of great encouragement to see the brothers and the sisters that have also gathered here who are also conversing with God through this process. You are not alone. So you take 30 seconds there and then you close your eyes again and you look ahead and you think about heaven and you think about a place where nothing is entangling, where there is no suffering, where there is no cost, there is no hardship. It is as God created the world to be. And, we, and we just, you just take 30 seconds and we just long for the day that we get to spend eternity with God. This is for the Christian. It really is. And, you know, Paul actually, one of the times he was talking about communion in another letter to another church, he said, hey, if you're not a Christian, if you're on the fence, if you're not sure about this, well, this really doesn't carry any significance for you. And so... If you're not a Christian, really, you should just sit and consider these things. But taking communion really is for people who have decided to follow Jesus. And so I'm not asking if you're perfect, because then none of us would be able to take communion. But I'm asking if you're a follower of Jesus to, to come up, to take communion, to look back, to look around, and to look ahead. And I, I pray that in the next few minutes, the Lord will speak into your life. While communion's happening, there will be a prayer team in the back. We would really be honored if you would pray with us. If something's going on in your life that you'd like to pray with somebody about, we would love to pray with you. It can be about anything that we've talked about today or anything else. We're here every week to pray with you, and the team will be in the back. Let me pray for us, and then we'll take communion. Thanks for watching. To find out more about our church, about when and where we meet, about joining a group, about serving on a team, about giving online, you can find all of it at threecreekschurch.com.